Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our third webinar of 2021, a part of our panel ambassador program. Uh, my name is Lauren. I'm the executive director of the Chris Klug Foundation, and I'll be introducing you to today's moderator and panelists. I'd first like to thank our presenting partner, Student Organ Donation Advocates, or SODA, and our generous sponsor, the Hearts for Rest Foundation. If you're new to Zoom webinar, you'll notice that you have a Q&A box to field questions to the panelists on your console. We're going to have a brief Q&A at the end of the presentation, so we'd encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat, as they come to mind. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Dr. Alex Kula. Dr. Kula is currently a pediatric nephrology fellow at Seattle Children's Hospital, University of Washington. He's also a liver transplant recipient after being diagnosed with primary sclerosis cholangitis, PSC. Dr. Kula received a life-saving split liver transplant from his uncle at 19 years old. In many ways, this transplant was more than just a receipt of a healthy liver, but it was also inspired him to pursue a career in medicine. After completing medical school at Yale, Dr. Kula moved to Seattle to complete his pediatric residency at Seattle Children's, where he's currently in the second year of his pediatric nephrology fellowship. His research focuses on helping young patients with severe illness, including organ failure, transplants, and to maintain their kidney health as they progress from children to adults. Andy Atherin. Andy began at Donate, at Donate Life Indiana in 2018 as the co-director and education specialist responsible for educating youth in Indiana schools and working with community partners to promote a youth initiative to raise awareness for organ donation and transplantation. This role has allowed her to develop an engaging curriculum that educates and enlightens teens on the benefits of organ donation and gives them the capability to make more educated decisions when asked to register as an organ donor at the DMV. Robin Caldwell. Robin is an undergraduate studying human services at Hudson Valley Community College. She is currently working with the nonprofit Student Organ Donation Advocates, SODA, as their programming coordinator. Robin's also the daughter of a deceased organ donor. She currently resides in Wineskill, New York with her father and two sisters. She continues to raise this awareness while honoring her mother and her family's journey through organ donation process. And last but not least, your moderator for this webinar, liver transplant recipient, Olympian, and founder of the Chris Klug Foundation, Chris Klug. Thanks a lot, Lauren. Welcome to everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us tonight. Hope uh, you're all doing well and staying healthy and enjoying a great winter. It feels like springtime here in Aspen, Colorado. And uh, as a lifelong snowboarder, I'm hoping for a few more powder days. So hoping this doesn't mean that uh, it's time to dust off our bikes, although I love that. Uh, I'd like to get a few more powder days in before uh, winter's over. Uh, hopefully, we'll keep doing our snow dance. I'm getting ready for a big ski mountaineering race that I'm doing next weekend called the Power of Four that uh, takes you from Snowmass Village, where I live, to the top of all four of our ski resorts, about 12,000 vertical, and uh, finishes in Aspen. So that ought to be a, a royal butt kicker next weekend. But I love doing these kind of things as uh, as those of you that that know me selfishly I enjoy the challenge and love to ski and snowboard and spend the day uh, in the mountains with my friends but uh, it's also really really neat to be able to show uh, my community and to show the world what's possible after uh, an organ transplant and uh, Dr. Cool I know you know something about PSC and about uh, bouncing back from uh, a liver transplant and from being on uh, a transplant waiting list and hoping and praying for that second chance. That's where I was uh, for almost six years uh, back in uh, the mid and late 90s and very grateful to be here. And tonight we have a great opportunity with uh, uh, Andy and, and Robin and, and Dr. Kula to have a conversation about the ABCs of organ donation. And uh, these guys are all experts in the uh, respective fields and uh, experts on sharing that message and, and encouraging others to have that decision and to document that decision. Um, and so we'll hope that this knuckle dragging snowboarder doesn't uh, get us too off track here and keep us focused on uh, how we can eliminate the weight and help everybody get a transplant just like uh, Alex, you and I did. 
Um, I, what I'd like to do is I'll just jump in for a couple minutes, tell my story, and then you guys can each share your story uh, for a few minutes in your own words. And then uh, right here, I've got some very tough questions. So get ready. This is uh, going to go well beyond the ABCs of organ donation. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to have a, a fun conversation tonight and feel free to steal the mic and uh, um, share what you want to. The, the whole idea and goal here is to have a uh, fun and entertaining conversation, but educate people about uh, the ABCs of organ donation. I, I know every time I get the opportunity to speak with experts like yourselves and, and friends in the transplant community, I learned something. So I'm sure that will be the case again tonight. So I'll share my story just for a couple of minutes. I think some of you are familiar with it, so I promise I won't uh, be too long, but really grateful to still be here. As I said, uh, I am a 20 year liver transplant recipient. After about six years on a transplant waiting list, uh, I got that second chance at life. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't trade it in for anything. It was an awesome experience. And I know it sounds cliche, but it gave me the perspective that I have today. And uh, I sort of um, relived that just a little bit this morning. I got my vaccination this morning for COVID and I shared with um, our fellow panelists this morning. It was really emotional. It was neat to see our community celebrating that uh, I would say victory in uh, this pandemic over the last year and, and just fun to see everybody celebrating. And that's kind of how I felt when I got my transplant, just so grateful for that uh, new lease on life. And I think really focused on making the most of it. And uh, I know, again, it, it sounds sort of uh, corny, but you know, my, my mantra has always been, don't take a single turn for granted and uh, enjoy the ride. And I live that, try to live my life uh, every day to the fullest because we all know that life is so precious and uh, got to make the most of every minute. So it may seem crazy kiteboarding and surfing and snowboarding and doing these crazy things, but um, that's how I live life to the fullest. And as I said, just like next weekend in the power of four, it's really fun to let the world know what's possible after a transplant. So as a 20 year liver transplant recipient, um, when I was on that transplant waiting list, I said, you know, if I get through this, I, I said to God uh, and my faith, and I said to my family and myself, I'm gonna do everything I can to give back and, and help others uh, going through the same thing that I did almost 20 years ago. And that's really what Chris Kluke Foundation is all about is a nonprofit organization dedicated to um, educating people about the importance of organ donation and and help inspire those that are going through the process uh, like I did, or those that uh, have already gone through it and are trying to bounce back to a great quality of life. Uh, and so it's all about education, registration, and inspiration. And uh, that's kind of what our conversation is all about tonight. Um, so just again, wanna say thanks to uh, our panelists for being a part of this tonight and uh, thanks to our participants. Hope uh, everybody gets a lot out of this tonight. Uh, on that note, Andy, can I pass the mic over to you and uh, you can share your connection uh, as a Hoosier to uh, organ donation and uh, how you got involved in this and uh, what uh, what it means to you. Yes, uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, I have heard your story, but I tell you every time you say something new and uh, it's just, it's fun to hear you because you uh, the emotion's always there. You bring it. Uh, you bring your personality, and that's not always easy on uh, camera, but uh, we can definitely tell that uh, how much that liver transplant means to you, even with you being on camera and so far away from me here in Indiana. Um, so uh, everyone, my name is Andy, and uh, when I tell that to students, of course, they look at me like, well, that's a boy's name. Um, and I say, well, it's Andy with an I, guys. That's the first thing. That's the first conversation always with students. Um, but I got into this, I was a teacher, I come from a family of teachers and nurses, and so when you think about the dynamic there, uh, wh why do we go into those occupations, those careers, it's about helping people, uh, and that is why I taught for 10 years, and um, when I heard about Indiana Donor Network, which is the OPO in Indiana, and Donate Life Indiana, there was an education role and they needed somebody to come in and develop curriculum. They needed the energy because how do you teach something? You know, people speak about death and dying and they get a little bit fearful. They get a little bit squeamish. And how do you teach this 
um, in a manner where you're not going to frighten kids, um, but also you want to be engaging. Uh, and so in my classroom, I always said, um, I don't want to teach from the book. Uh, we're not going to open a book and turn pages. And, and so that's what I've tried to bring into the classroom. We talk a lot about the benefits and we talk about how we can help others. And so uh, having a background in teaching um, has been very helpful. And uh, on the other side of things, uh, I am a tissue recipient. Uh, tore my left ACL in college basketball, and uh, when I share that with high school students, I say my ligament in my left knee, uh, they replaced it with um, donor tissue, a patellar tendon. I said, it, my tendon is older than all of you guys in this classroom, and, and so they get a kick out of that, uh, literally. So um, with that being said, I'm a tissue recipient, former teacher, but now I'm getting to do this, and it all relates back to wanting to help others. And that's exactly what I'm out there doing in the classroom. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. My uh, wife and my mom are both uh, teachers. My wife's a adolescent counselor and uh, love what you do. Thanks for giving back and uh, helping the next, uh, the next generation coming up um, and also teaching them about the importance of organ donation. It's only appropriate that you're a great basketball player coming from Indiana too. I just had to add that. <laughs> And you know what? I was just at Milan High School on Tuesday, and Milan is history. That's where Hoosiers was filmed. And so how funny that you say that. <laughs> I love Thank one, you. Of my, one of my favorite movies. <laughs> Robin Caldwell, can I pass the mic to you? You are uh, currently a student organ donation advocate, a uh, SOTA representative uh, at Hudson Valley Community College. And uh, you know a thing or two about um, talking ABCs of organ donation. So often when we did uh, Chris Klug Foundation events all over the country at events like the Warp Vans Warp Tour and uh, the US Pro Cycling Challenge, we still do uh, events at the Winter X Games every year in Aspen, unfortunately not in person this year with what's going on. But so often somebody would walk up and just say, what is this Chris Klug Foundation? Who is this guy? And what so? What is this about organ donation? Tell me about it. And I know you've gotten that question so much. So love to hear more about uh, your involvement and what you're doing at uh, Hudson Community College. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to speak and share my story. Um, so about five and a half years ago, uh, my mom was in an accident. Um, it was a freak accident. Unfortunately, um, her and her husband went to the beach for the day they, on the motorcycle. Um, they were coming home and the nail or the tire hit a nail and the tire popped. And unfortunately, uh, my mom ended up in trauma arrest. And by the time the EMTs got there, they were able to resuscitate her, but she was without oxygen for too long. So she was airlifted to a hospital in Boston. Um, and as you know, I'm in New York, so quite a drive. <laughs> um, so we ended up, I got a phone call from my sister that there was an accident um, and it kind of just went from there, you know, calling all the hospitals. Um, unfortunately, she came in as a Jane Doe. So when that happens, I mean, we're calling the hospitals asking, you know, do you have this person? Do you have this person? And I mean, they don't have her ID. So we eventually found what hospital she was at and they, you know, did tell us, um, you know, she's very, very sick. You need to get here. Um, it's not looking good. So it's, you know, late at night. Um, so we got in the car and we headed to Boston and we got there and, you know, they sat us down and told us, you know, it's not looking good. Um, and at that point, we didn't know she was an organ donor. Um, and we've actually, I think it might have come up when I was younger, but it really didn't. It wasn't a conversation and she was a registered organ donor. Um, so I will get into more of that um, later in the conversation. But, um, you know, it really, it, it just completely changed my outlook on everything and how many people she helped. I mean, she ended up donating to 70 people um, between uh, her right kidney, her two corneas and her um, bone and skin tissue, which was awesome. Um, and we did actually receive a letter from someone who received her tissue. And like Andy, um, they turned it into, a believe a ligament you said and they she couldn't walk before and now this lady you know she sent us a letter and she can walk now and she was getting married and she's like I'm so excited to walk down the aisle and it's all thanks to your mom and it's 
it just really changes your perspective on everything. Robin, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing the story of your mom. And uh, she's the real hero of this process. I know we've had a discussion about this in the past that it's, uh, it, they're not the heroes and, and uh, it's the right thing to do, but I still think they're the, uh, they're the gold medalists and they're the heroes. And, and it's, it's amazing to me that after that experience here, you are still giving back and, uh, and sharing the importance of organ donation. And, and a lot of people might say, the heck with organ donation, I lost my mom. I don't even wanna talk about it anymore. I don't wanna be involved. And, uh, and yet you continue to give back to this community. And uh, that's a real testament to your character. It was interesting too, because you know what? I mean, it is hard, you know, when you're going through the grieving process. Um, I think the letter from one of her recipients really just like pushed it and it was like, yeah, I can do something with this. And this really affects so many people and um, just the difference you can make. I'm really excited to be here. Well, you honor her in a great way by uh, being here and continuing uh, to do your work. So thank you. Thanks. Dr. Alex Kula, my PSC brother. Yes. You uh, had a, a liver transplant recipient like me and uh, really inspired you to get involved uh, in the medical profession to go to Yale and uh, study medicine. And uh, now you're, uh, you've got the unique perspective of having gone through the process and now uh, helping others as they go through that process, especially teens uh, as they reach adulthood and, and helping them take care of themselves and, uh, and stick to their regimen. Can you share a little bit more about your journey? Sure, yeah, um, just like you said, uh, all of this started uh, for PSC. So just like Chris, I had PSC, but unlike Chris, I'm very bad at snowboarding. So it's always- <laughs> We can you know, fix that, Doc. I can help you in that department. You can please inspire me. Um, uh, but, but um, you know, really just, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here today. And, you know, it's because of the efforts like the Chris Klug Foundation and Soda and Robin and Andy, along with the grace and generosity of donor families that really so much has become possible. Even when you look back 10, 20 years, there's so much more we can do for people in organ donation and tissue donation is really transformative. So I'm just very grateful for everyone's, um, you know, everyone's efforts to con continually improve that increase access. And so my story started back when I was 15. I was relatively healthy until um, I was diagnosed with something called ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. And so while they're doing blood tests for that, they noticed the liver, uh, my liver function tests were a little bit elevated. So around a year later, um, after a few more kind of um, tinkering around, they figured out that I had primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Now, for the most part, I continued to live my normal life, or I guess relatively normal life as much as possible. And, um, you know, I worked really hard to do everything my doctors told me to do. I worked really hard to try to live a healthy lifestyle. But, you know, sometimes there's only so much you can control. And over the next four years, my liver fibrosis continued to progress until when I was 19, I was in fulminant liver failure. And so I came back home, I had been at school, and um, it was time to think about getting an organ donation, a life-saving liver transplant. However, at that time, the transplant list was quite long. And so I was in a precarious position of being rather sick, but there were just no organs available. And so while living in this kind of purgatory, um, the center where I was getting my treatment at, which was the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona, was one of the few centers that did living liver donations for adults, where they take half of a liver um, from a living donor and donate to um, an individual like me. And so we went through the process of trying to find someone to be to serve that role for me to really give me that second chance. And and it's a very very daunting um, set of tests you have to go through. And we have, luckily I have big families on both sides. And so there's lots of people to test, but needless to say, a few months later, we had gone through 15 people, but none of them were a good match. And so then things were becoming even a little bit more precarious. But then luckily my last family member who had just finished a work um, project and was able to come out to Arizona to be tested, my uncle, Jim Kula, uh, he got tested and he was a great match. And so February 21st, 2007, which is Recently, just 14 years ago, um, I received half of my I received half of the liver from him, and um, 
was able to really have a second chance at life and go back to doing the things that I love. And really, um, like Lauren said earlier, it was more than just a transfer of an organ or some tissue. It really was a transfer and opportunity. And um, thanks to my uncle, my uncle's selfless gift, um, it's just um, I've really been able to have a very um, meaningful and happy life. And so because of that, I've really been inspired and it really kind of pumps me up to see how we can do the same um, for young adults and young people now who are also living with organ failure. So that's, that's what really inspired me through my medical training and um, got me to where I am today. That's awesome. Thanks, Doc. I love what uh, your uncle, Jim Kula said when it was determined that he was the right match. I reread the uh, blog that uh, you and Cece, our, our program director with CKF did. And uh, I love what he said. He said, Alex, don't thank me. I want to do this, to paraphrase. But mm -hmm. I thought that was uh, really powerful. He said, hey, don't ever thank me for this. I'm, this is my decision, and I'm excited to do it. So that's a very Absolutely. cool thing. And he continues to maintain that stance to this day. And I like even have offered, what about just washing your car once a year? Or what can I do to make it up? And, you know, he, he absolutely won't let me thank him. And so it's just really, it truly was a selfless act. And it really, I think, is a touchstone in my life for um, what I'd like to do moving forward. And as a uh, donor, he, his recovery went well and uh, he bounced back uh, to full health. Yeah. So donating a liver is a big surgery. Um, but he made a full recovery and he's back to full health and um, doing all the things he loves to do. That's awesome. Congrats to him too. All right, Andy, I'm going to uh, come back to you. We are uh, going to start with the basics here, ABCs. Can you tell me, first of all, what exactly is organ donation? We throw that around all the time. What is it when, I, when we say, yes, I'm an organ donor, I support organ donation? Right. Um, so one of the first things that, you know, I always share with students is signing up to be an organ donor is completely your decision. Um, now, if you're under 18, obviously uh, that decision still belongs with your parents or your guardian. But that doesn't say that you can't still sign up. Um, now, once you've signed up to be an organ donor, um, you know, we always make certain to say organ donation typically happens after we are deceased. Now, Dr. Kula is going to talk a little bit more about living donation, but typically after we are deceased, if we have signed up to be an organ donor, then we are saying we want our organs and our tissue to be utilized for transplantation. And so then that brings the next question, well, why would we want to do that? Well, we sign up to be organ donors and then, you know, after we're deceased because we want to help others. And that's truly what it comes down to. And uh, I'm going to share a quick screen because this is one that I share a lot in the classroom. The idea that when we sign up to be an organ donor uh, and we call them organ donor heroes, that we have the ability to save and heal how many lives? 83 lives. Okay. And so um, a lot of students don't know that tissue donation is just as important. And, and so Sometimes our organs might not all be viable, but we have up to eight life-saving organs to donate and then up to 75 different ways the tissue within our body can be utilized. So 83 lives signing up to be an organ donor hero, and that's the legacy that we can leave behind. Quite a legacy, Andy, that uh, we can leave behind, as you said, even if we're not here, to uh, help 83 people save or uh, enhance or improve their lives is uh, pretty remarkable. Absolutely. Their uh, students are, you know, I, I always start out my conversation with them. Does anybody understand or does anybody want to take a guess at what the number 83 um, is significant of? Mm -hmm. And uh, we get all kinds of answers. 83 organs we can donate. 83. <laughs> um, yeah, they do. They call out, um, 83 is the oldest you can be to donate. And we come back to know 83 lives you can save and heal. That's awesome. Now, in the Transmite community, we love throwing around all kinds of acronyms. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about uh, what role an OPO plays in the transplant process? Absolutely. 
And uh, I'm going to go to my next slide here. Uh, so OPOs, Organ Procurement Organizations. Um, so biggest thing, they facilitate organ, eye, and tissue recovery. Uh, they are the link as to, you know, Chris and Dr. Kula are here today because of OPOs. They are the link for those waiting for that life-saving organ transplant. But we don't want to forget that donor family and that donor hero, because I also um, cannot stand here and say that OPOs are not with the donor family. Robin, you know, your mom, every step of the way, because um, after a donor hero has uh, donated those organs or tissue, we are there with them because we know that is a tragedy but we also know and we talk to them and educate the family about that, how they are bringing hope uh, for that family maybe down the hall that has been waiting for a life-saving transplant. And so we have an entire department at the OPO dedicated to taking care of the donor family as well, because both sides are just as important. And without a, an organ donor, there is no recipient. I'm not here today. Uh, if it's not for the selfless decision of my donor family who were complete strangers to me, said yes to organ donation, saved my life and others. And uh, without that heroic decision, I'm not here. And my kids aren't here. The, the ripple effect is incredible. Right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And we always remind students of that. Uh, the circle of life starts with that donor hero and that person that made that decision, so. Yeah, it's fun. I, I drag my kids to all the donor dudes events and donor dashes and uh, New York City marathons with our CKF team and of course the Leadville 100. And uh, they're really well versed in it. And they even have that conversation with their seven and nine year old buddies. And uh, so you do see that being exposed to it and uh, the fact that dad's here as a result of it uh, is, is pretty powerful and that conversation continues. Right, yep, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Kula, what, what organs can be donated? Uh, Andy just talked about the number 83. Yeah. And I'd love for you to elaborate a little bit on um, how living donation works and sure. how can you actually be a donor and um, live on just like your uncle Jim. Yes. So, um, so Andy, that's a great, great slide. I need some PowerPoint tips from you. Cause I think it really illustrates very well the, just the incredible, um, gift that one organ donor and tissue donor can have for a large number of people. And so 75 of those people are going to receive tissue like skin, they can have corneal transplants. Sometimes people have eye injuries or eye disease. They can have tendons when you have injuries. And so there's a multitude of people who will benefit in that way. In addition, there are six organs that can be donated. So the kidneys, the liver, the pancreas, the heart, and the lungs. And um, just for a quick aside, the pancreas is the organ that is dysfunctional in diabetes. So that's why uh, most often it's transplanted. Now, while there's six organs that are transplanted, eight people can benefit from a life-saving gift. That's because for the kidneys, you have two of them. And so um, you really only need one kidney to do all the, the functions your body requires. And so two people will receive one kidney each from that donor. Same for the lungs. So the lungs, two recipients will each receive one lung, and that's what they need. Um, and they're able to, to go back to breathing um, well again. And so in terms of being a living donor, now the only two organs that kind of um, fall under this uh, umbrella are the liver. And this is when you can give half of your liver. Um, the liver then grows back full size in the donor and the half that was implanted into the recipient also grows back full size. So it's a pretty incredible organ. And you can also donate one of your two kidneys to somebody. And so how you become a living donor, well, the most common way people become living donors is um, through friends and family, similar to what happened with me. 
And so, for example, now in my role um, in, as a pediatric nephrologist, when we have young people who need a kidney transplant, often we'll talk to the family and say, is there anyone you know who might be able to be or might be able to donate a kidney? And often that starts a conversation within the family, sometimes within the extended families or close friends. And that's the most common way. There are some other methods. Often if you go on social media, there's a long list of Facebook pages and groups from individuals who need a kidney transplant most commonly. And so sometimes you can be matched up outside of the hospital or outside of your family with someone who um, needs a donation. And um, just as one kind of last little um, plug, so I was lucky enough to receive um, a split liver transplant from my uncle. Um, but most often that's actually employed for children. So um, especially because kids are so much smaller that often that split liver is just what they need. So really, I guess if I have to sum it all up, the best way is if you know someone who needs a donation, it's having that conversation with them. Otherwise, there's lots of resources if you were to search online and um, lots of people who could benefit from that organ. Doc, I think the liver uh, is an incredible organ. The fact that it can regenerate, I believe it's the only mm -hmm. organ that can. Mm -hmm. And when you do a, as you said, a uh, living donor liver transplant or split liver donation, as you, as you shared, doesn't the uh, organ, doesn't it regenerate the liver within like three to five months in both the donor and in the recipient? Yeah, so it really um, is pretty substantial. It's substantially larger in just a few months, um, nearly full size. And within a year, mostly, you know, it's almost at full size. And within a year, it's usually back to full size. Now, the one disclaimer is um, it might not be a pretty liver. So sometimes it kind of grows back in a funky shape, but it grows back in a totally appropriate shape so that it can do all the function that the body needs. And there's no um, downsides from that. So it's, it's really incredible because every other organ in our body doesn't have that ability. That's incredible. Andy, I want to come back to you before uh, we put Robin in the hot seat here. Um, can you help us understand the transplant waiting list and how that process works? We had a question uh, in the Q&A, which we will get to at the end, uh, about what's the timeline for a transplant for my son who's waiting? Right. Yeah. So I am going to share my screen again um, because I've got, I love to use visuals, uh, especially if you know that I'm out in the community and I'm speaking to middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students. We love pictures, images that we can relate. So I'm going to go back to my screen and uh, let's share this. So the transplant waiting list, uh, let's talk a little bit about it. And I know, uh, Chris, you've been on this before, so you might be able to relate. Uh, on the other side of things, um, you typically, you don't wait on the wait list for tissue. Tissue is actually stored at a tissue bank. Um, so when I received my ligament, doctors were able to call the tissue bank. Um, and as long as they were able to get that ligament or tendon and the size was right, then I did not wait on a wait list. Um, but back to the transplant waiting list, take a uh, look at this picture. And some of you think in your heads and your minds, have you ever been in a traffic jam before and what does it feel like when you are at a dead stop and uh, you've got to be somewhere and you know you're not going to make it and uh, you're sitting there and you're sitting there and you're waiting and you truly are not moving for hours and hours. Well, that is just somewhat relatable to what the transplant waiting list would feel like because there are people on the transplant waiting list sometimes for hours, sometimes for months sometimes for years. And when we talk about that, it's because we cannot determine when a deceased organ donor hero will become available. Sadly, organ donation happens in a lot of accidents, things that are completely unexpected. And so, you know, the kidney is the most needed organ. There are people that are waiting anywhere from seven to nine years in what, you know, appears to be this traffic jam, not knowing when they're gonna get that kidney unless a living donor um, comes forward. And so just to explain it a little bit more, um, the transplant waiting list, I know you're not all from Indiana, but I'm gonna show the Colts stadium. I am a Colts fan. Sorry for those of you out there that are, that are not, but um, 
sadly, guys, if I were to fill Lucas Oil Stadium where the Colts play, that would be over 100,000 people. And guess what? That's how many people are waiting right now on the transplant waiting list. Now, this is a computerized database, and it is owned by the United Network for Organ Sharing. Uh, and in that database, these over 100,000 people don't know where they're waiting. But gradually, as you get sicker or more severe, you can move up that wait list. Uh, but if that organ donor hero is not in proximity or not somewhere around you and you don't have that same blood type, which Dr. Kula is going to get into more, then you continue to wait on that organ transplant. And the last thing I want to add here is every 10 minutes, somebody new goes on that wait list. So every 10 minutes, somebody new is added into that stadium. And, and so the transplant waiting list is a very complex situation of over 100,000 people in this computer database system. Nobody knows where their number is, um, and, and we can't determine always when they're going to get that match from that donor hero. As Broncos fans, it's hard to uh, understand the Colts analogy, but I got the rest of it. <laughs> I, kn I knew there was going to be a comeback. I'm like, <laughs> I've got to show the Indiana Stadium. I thought about, do I need to show Colorado? You know, do I need to show the Broncos? Mile high, of course. Well, we haven't <laughs> had a lot to cheer about in the uh, Broncos department the last couple of years. But, <laughs> but I believe you did, have a, you did have a Peyton Manning. So, you know, like, I was so sad about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Robin, your turn. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on what it was like when you were first approached uh, about your mom's passing and somebody came up to you and said, uh, well, do you know what her organ donation decision or wishes were? But what was that like, if you're okay sharing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I want to go back to what Andy said, how the OPOs are really involved with the donor families. Um, I actually just had a conversation <laughs> with that OPO today about my mom and um, some recipients. We just had a conversation about it. So they definitely, even five years later, um, they're very much involved in the donor families. Um, so yeah, so um, like I said, so she was airlifted to the hospital. Um, my stepdad was not in as bad condition as her. So he actually ended up at a different hospital. So that was Saturday night. Didn't realize she was an organ donor at that point. Sunday, we woke up, we're going through, you know, okay, how is she? All of this. And that's when New England Donor Services approached us um, Sunday afternoon. And they said, you know, she's a registered organ donor. And um, the wording is a bit fuzzy. Um, honestly, you know, when you go through something like that, you know, it's like the memories, you know, come and go. But um, I do remember sitting down with them. Um, the biggest issue was that my stepdad was at a different location. Um, and she was a registered organ donor, but they still, you know, needed some kind of, you know, consent disclosure and wanted to go over um, what to donate for her. So they definitely, they called him, they did get papers signed. Um, and then they had, they sat us down. Uh, my grandma was there as well, my sisters and my dad. Um, and we just had a conversation about it. We went through, you know, um, everything. What organs can we donate? Um, and then um, they wanted to wait until my stepdad could get there. We okayed everything. Um, and, but by the time your organs start failing, you only have so much time to donate these organs. So that's what happened Monday morning. Um, her organs started failing, she, you know, she started deteriorating. So they were like, you know, we have to do this now. So what happens is you go into the room and you say your goodbyes. Um, you really only have five minutes from the time she passes away or your loved one passes away until, you know, they can get down into that operating room. So um, we did that. We said our goodbyes. And then, you know, they, they are so great, the OPOs. They send you... Um, this like care package and, you know, a card and they keep you updated with everything. Um, and it, they're just really great. Robin, thanks so much for sharing that. I, uh, I really appreciate it. I know that's must have been a very challenging time. And, and some families, I, I know that I, I've learned over the years of being involved in, uh, in not that specific conversation, but the conversation uh, about uh, somebody approaching you about sharing 
uh, or being an organ donor. So I think oftentimes people that haven't had that conversation before aren't prepared for that in any way whatsoever. It's kind of like, hey, don't bother me right now. I'm dealing with a horrible family tragedy. I don't want to talk organ donation right now. And so is it, does it make it that much more important to have the conversation in the comfort of your home and say, hey, mom, dad, brother, sister, if anything ever happens to me, this is what I want to happen. I would imagine in the circumstance or the, the situation that you explained is probably the last imaginable place you ever want to have that conversation for the first time. Absolutely. Um, I definitely, I encourage everybody <laughs> to definitely discuss it and discuss everything, you know, ev their wishes from start to finish. Um, because, you know, it was a great thing that she registered because we didn't have to think about it. Um, she, that's what she wanted. She was such a caring person. You know, she was a companion for the elderly. She loved animals. She was constantly helping people. So, it was definitely a no brainer once they mentioned it, but yeah, if you don't have that conversation with your loved one and you really don't know, I mean, it's so much better to have that talk up front because you are, you're in like a daze in that type of situation and it's so much better to talk about it beforehand. Good for you. Thank you. Dr. Kula, just like uh, Robin just explained the uh, situation when she was confronted with that question, uh, what then is happening um, on the OPO or the medical side, how do they match the donor and the recipient? And, and, and how does that work exactly? Okay. Well, and Chris, you're kind of a cool guy. Is that all right if I get a little nerdy for a minute here? Totally. <laughs> all right. All right. It's just so interesting though. And I mean, it's really something having gone through a transplant with no understanding of it. Now that, you know, I've, what I've learned over the last few years, it's just, it's a really fascinating aspect of transplantation. And so um, when it becomes that a, a organ's available, now this is, there's kind of a few principles that are important. The first two are for whether it's a deceased or living donation, and there's a few considerations just for the living um, donation scenarios. So first off, what we need to understand is, um, is the organ a match in terms of our immune systems? Is it an immune match? And so what do I mean by that? So on the simplest level, you look at blood type. Often we want to match blood type. So if there's an if the donor's an A, you try to match it to an A recipient. But then there's one level of complexity further, which is very important and actually even more important than blood type often. And that's something called the human leukocyte antigen, HLA loci. And so what's so interesting, and when we think about how challenging transplantation is, is that us as humans are very similar genetically, very, very, very similar genetically. And that, that's regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, we're all really the same from a genetic standpoint. Now, the one exception to that is our HLA loci. And in that circumstance, all of us are unique from each other. And so the HLA loci is really what determines your immune system and it's a set of proteins and it's a random assortment that can go a bunch of different ways that really are the proteins your immune system uses to constantly surveil around your body and say, hey, is there anything here that shouldn't be? Is there a virus? Is there a bacteria? And so it's very important because it's helped us fight off infections for millennia. Now the challenge comes when you have a transplant, this is going to be something different. And everyone's HLA is kind of a different combination. And so that often will lead to that mismatch and will set off an immune response. And that immune response will attack the organ and prevent it from working and cause it to fail. And so when we're looking to match, one of the most important things is we look at the HLA match and how similar are your combinations of this large group of proteins and based off what we know from experience and from a lot of research, we know that certain pairs seem to go, go together better. And so that's something when, if you're a recipient, you're often um, donating blood to kind of update what your HLA pattern is and what are some kind of matches that your body wouldn't like. And so once you have all that, when someone becomes a donor, their set of proteins, their HLA, their kind of immune identity is sent out to the transplant list. Transplant centers know the handshake, they know the identity of their recipients. And so they can kind of do what we call a virtual cross match. And there we use computer algorithms to kind of 
try to match people um, that are most appropriate. And that is something that really over the last 20, 30 years has done incredible things in improving outcomes for transplant patients. Where it used to be rejection was inevitable or, um, or very likely that now we're really doing a great job of when you get an organ, it lasts for a long time because we know it's compatible. And so once someone has that immune match, there's a second set of considerations, which is size. And it's as simple as it sounds. So if I have a two-year-old patient who has kidney failures, it's gonna be very difficult to transplant a giant kidney from a huge adult because it just won't fit. The arteries and the veins are mismatched and it's not going to work if it's too big or too small. So size is something we also have to think about. Now, lastly, if you're a living donor, one of the most important considerations is risk to the donor and doing everything we can to minimize that. And um, from the medical perspective, minimizing donor risk is the most important thing. So if someone has even just the slightest chance of an increased chance of a bad outcome if they donate an organ, often they won't be accepted, even if they're a good match on a lot of other aspects. And so that's really important. And that's something that in medicine we feel is important because if someone is going to make the altruistic decision to donate an organ, you want to make sure that you're doing it safely in a way that reduces risk for them. And so this big set of things are all considered by your transplant doctors or the transplant doctors when it comes that an organ um, might be available. That makes sense. Thanks a lot for the explanation. Mm -hmm. Andy, we uh, deal with a lot of myths and misconceptions about organ donation, and I'm sure you've heard them all. But what do you say to somebody when they say, oh, my, my religion doesn't uh, support organ donation or doesn't permit organ donation? Right. Um, so first and foremost, um, as I said from the very beginning, that organ donation is a personal decision if you choose to sign up to be an organ donor. And so when people do say, my religion doesn't support this, um, I say each decision is, you know, a personal one. Uh, and I'm, uh, you know, I've been sharing my slide deck, so I might as well keep sharing, right? Um, one other thing that I point out is consult with your faith leader, because I certainly don't want to step in place of their faith leader and who they follow and who they have that personal connection with. Uh, because I think that they're going to have more of a bond with them and be able to listen to that faith leader. And then lastly, I though I always say this, is that all major religions in the U.S. support donation. Uh, they look at this as a final act of compassion and generosity. And uh, then I kind of leave it there because it is their personal decision. Um, the last thing that I want to kind of say is you know, I'm here as the educator, the teacher, and I truly, um, when I hear some of the misconceptions and when I hear um, some of the myths about organ donation, I come back to education. And I feel like tonight's webinar and all of us here, and if we leave this webinar and we can go and educate somebody else, I feel like we can bridge that gap. Because if you look at this, if 95% of people are in favor of organ donation, but only 58% have signed up. The more education we can keep providing, the more we can bridge that gap. So that's all I got. Still a bit of a uh, gap there that we have to overcome. We've come a long way in the last uh, couple decades since I, uh, I first learned of, uh, of organ donation, well, almost 20, 26 years ago. Um, we've come a long ways, but we still have our work cut out for us. Absolutely. So Robin, I'm sitting around the dinner table tonight and uh, I just did the ABCs of organ donation. I've done some more research and uh, I say to my wife, Missy and my kids, guys, if something happens to me, give it all away. How do I sign up and how do I document that decision? Absolutely. Um, so you can uh, do online or in person through your motor vehicle department. Um, you can also go through Donate Life America. The because Christmas going to the DMV is so much fun. You do want to uh, make sure you don't miss that opportunity. So there is an online option, yes. 
Um, you can also go through Donate Life America, um, the Chris Klug Foundation, or Student Organ Donation Advocates, SOTA. <laughs> so DMV online through uh, SOTA or chrisklugfoundation.org. Um, yeah, yeah. Obviously having the conversation with your family and just like I said, guys, this, this is my wish. And uh, if something happens to me, let's, uh, let's make sure this happens. Have the conversation, go to the DMV, sign up online. Yes. I love it. Well said. Uh, Lauren, do we have some uh, questions from the audience we want to open it up to? We do. Um, and I think everyone can see the questions, but um, Gloria has pretty specific ones, but I think it opens up co the conversation. Gloria says, my son is on the kidney, tra kidney transplant list for six years and an active snowboarder in Denver, Colorado. I like him already. <laughs> and while not on the active list, how soon will it take after being activated that he can get a kidney? And then she expands part of my son's disease process, ARPKD, CHF, the latter being congenital hepatic fibrosis, <laughs> which causes congenitalis spelling question mark. But to Dr. Alex Kula, how do you find the right liver doctor who understands this disease process? Knowing that this is very specific, but I think mm -hmm. um, if you guys want to address that. Yeah, I think, and I think um, first off, you know, ARPKD, um, it's a disease that you get some fibrosis and kind of thickening and um, of your kidneys and your liver. And um, it can cause both kidney and liver failure. And the fact that he's um, snowboarding is very impressive and uh, is, is an inspiration to me to, to give it a try again. But, um, but to answer both your questions, let me start with the first one. So it sounds like they're kind of considering or getting him worked up to be on the kidney transplant list. And so how long you wait depends on a few different factors. And so the, and it also depends on your age. So, um, and so if you're under 18, sometimes you get a little bit, you get to move a little ahead in the line a bit because, at, um, you know, we know that young people do really well at transplants. But if you're over 18, then the things that really matter is, one, how long you've been on the transplant list. Um, two, uh, everything we talked about in making an organ match. So uh, your, your HLA type, your blood type. And then three is any other considerations about the health. Sometimes, you know, someone will have a condition where, oh, we need to treat this first, then we can, um, we can make sure that he's um, in line for a kidney. And so often it can be very difficult to, to say because there are so many factors. But then getting to the second part of your question, um, there are definitely specialists who can help you understand that and the reason you live. And often it can also change by your geographic location. And so the best way to find someone um, who has expertise in both the kidney and liver um, um, kind of aspects is wherever you are, just to make it as simple as possible, go to Google and often just say, you know, hepatologist or hepatology or liver doctor near me or same thing for nephrology. And sometimes when you have a condition that has two different things affected, it makes more sense if it's possible with your insurance to go to a bigger hospital or a university system or somewhere where they'll have both set of specialists. So often it's a little easier to coordinate. Now, if you don't have that, it's still okay. This all can be done, especially now that so much is going on virtually, but often the best way is just say, hey, where's the big hospital in my town and who are the specialists? And I'll guarantee you that if you call any clinic or call any hospital and say, or even call your insurance provider, if that's um, if they have a number you can reach them at, and you say, this is the situation, I'm trying to find a doctor, they'll be very help. Um, they'll be very happy to, to help set you up with someone or get, point you in the right direction. Thanks, Doc. Doc, we've got another question for you. I could come up with, a, with some creative answers uh, on, uh, on some of these medical questions, but I'm not sure how factual they'll be. But uh, can you be an organ donor as a partial liver uh, transplant mm -hmm. recipient? And that's a tricky, that's a really tricky one. And it's, you know, what I'd say is it probably depends on why you had a transplant and what else is going on. And so I'll say that there have been rare cases for both kidneys and livers. Often it's in a short time frame where someone gets a transplant 
And then actually right away that organ goes to someone else because, and then often they get another organ. It's just this kind of crazy situation. They're very rare, those situations. You know, I think people are starting to explore that a little bit to say, um, you know, if you have a healthy liver, just because it was transplanted, it's still a healthy liver and it could be for someone else. Um, right now it's not common practice, but um, you know, I think it is something that we consider sometimes and maybe who knows one day in the future. It's, uh, I mean, we've come so far in the last uh, mm -hmm. 50 years. Oh yeah. Is there a, uh, a, a foreseeable future where mm -hmm. anti-rejection drugs are not necessary perhaps? And yeah. it's either gene therapy or, or something that mm -hmm. uh, doesn't necessitate uh, immunosuppression? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the ultimate goal. And there's, there are so many research labs and so many people trying to figure that out. It's a really interesting problem. If there are any um, kind of science nerds out there like me trying to think what they want to do with their lives, you should look at organ donation and trying to understand what we're doing for immunosuppression because, you know, it's a it's in some ways pretty crude that we're when you get a transplant, you basically turn down the whole immune system to um, to prevent the immune system from attacking it. But there should be ways that the ultimate dream would be to kind of trick the body into accepting the new organ. There are rare cases, um, most often actually with liver transplants, um, where um, this happens kind of spontaneously. But it's right now it's not understood why that happens. And so the risk of turning down medications to see if this happens more often is too high. So we can't really try it out on people. But I think that is the ultimate goal. And, um, and I think kind of is our understanding of the, it's really the immune system, which is causing us all these problems. It's very complicated and it constantly is making itself more complicated because think there's bacteria and viruses that are always changing out there in the environment. So your immune system has evolved to constantly change right with them. So it's, uh, it's what makes it a real um, challenge, but there's a lot of exciting new research being done. And we've gotten to the point that we can, um, in mice, you can, you can, uh, you can do a transplant without immunosuppression, but it's been really hard to get from, from doing it in a mouse um, up to people. It just hasn't really translated, but it's, it's very interesting. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we're gonna figure it out. Well, I am reading the mouse and the motorcycle with my seven-year-old son. So maybe that'll- uh, <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe you got a little in there. <laughs> for me. I'm, I'm down to one milligram of uh, tacrolimus morning and night. Oh, great. That's great. And sometimes often with time too, you'll see that the body just kind of like, you know, it's, it's like, if you have someone annoying sitting next to you, it's like a big deal at first, but you know, by the end of the movie, you're just like, ah, oh, whatever, you know? And so that's sometimes with time also, you'll see that people can actually tune down their immunosuppression. Yeah. I started with four and now I'm on one. So. Oh, wow. That's, that's great. Uh, Lauren, you got a question for uh, Andy and Robin that you want to uh, pass on? I do actually, I've gotten recently kicked off and my, my stuff's being regenerated. So if you guys can see the questions and go to the next one. Um, I've got a good one here from Doug, Andy. Great. Uh, what do you think is the most important thing a state administration, a state uh, donate life, um, I guess that would be the marketing arm of the OPO or an OPO can do within a state to raise the uh, organ donation registry? Right. Um, I think, you know, kind of leading back to my very last slide that I shared, I think one piece of that is education. Uh, being out in the community, having more, um, whether it's educators within the schools, because if you think about, if we can start educating middle school, high school, college students, we're gonna have the trickle effect where they're gonna go home and share that with their families and their grandparents who have never had this organ donation education. A second piece to that is I know Indiana and other states have a state mandated education. Um, so we have gotten that passed by legislative to uh, organ donation has to be taught within the high school health classroom. Um, now that's not saying that high school health teachers can't teach it, but we certainly as an OPO um, or as Donate Life want to go in and help educate it because we're in this world every day. Um, we've been in the operating room, we've watched transplant surgeries, um, and, and we want to be able to answer firsthand. Um, the third piece I would put, add to that, would be um, the volunteer aspect. 
Um, as an OPO, we have hundreds of what we call advocates, and they are out in the community spreading the word for us. And you know what? All we have to do on our end is we train them because we want to make sure they're out in the community using the right language. Um, but they are advocates just like Robin, just like Soda. Um, they can be student advocates or they can be adults, but they are out there spreading the word. We send the uh, promotional items. We send the informational cards. But you can have a whole train of people sharing your message for you because they want to. So that's how I would say we can raise the registry. I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> Robin, Delania has a question. She says, if someone wanted to get into the organ donation field, uh, what would be the best avenue to take? And I think that's probably a question for uh, Alex in terms of the medical side, but I wanna ask you specifically, maybe I'm tweaking Delania's question a little bit and I apologize, Delania, but how did you get started uh, in, in educating people about organ donation? And I imagine for you, that first step wasn't that easy. Yeah, um, so I really reached out to everybody. <laughs> um, I first, you know, really, I was very in contact with um, the OPO that my mom went through, but unfortunately, that's the one in Massachusetts and I'm in New York. So I was already working at a hospital um, on the back end of it. So I just started asking people and, you know, we figured out that the Center for Donation and Transplant in New York actually went through the hospital that I worked at. Um, so I reached out to their director and I was like, you know, this is my situation. This is my story. Um, what, what job do you think would be best? And, you know, how can I help out? And I started volunteering. Um, and it really led me, I'm in school right now, hopefully to be a family services coordinator and help organ donor families, just like New England donor services did for me. Um, and then, you know, from New England Donor Services, I heard about SODA and I reached out to them and it's just spiraled from there. It's really, you know, just reaching out and asking questions, ask all the questions. I love it. Um, question here from uh, Debbie and Nick. He's doing the same thing that, that really you did to get started. He's a kidney transplant recipient and being trained to volunteer uh, as, a, at a speaker, as a speaker at his local high school in New Jersey. Uh, he would love to get some more information on uh, the curriculum or outline that you have. Do you have sort of having done this quite a few times, Robin, a, um, a cheat sheet or a, a method to your madness that you know works and, and doesn't work as far as being uh, effective in communicating uh, the message of organ donation? Um, yeah, you know, I just, I try to tell the story and then I also, I mean, I try to see who I, what the audience is, um, which route I'm going to go. Um, and, you know, I really, I try to hold back a little bit, you know, whatever questions they have, you know, I try to elaborate and, you know, just be as clear as possible and um, really not try to push it either. I mean, I'm very much an advocate for it, but I also want people to make their own decisions. So, um, you know, just give them all the information and just be clear with it and educational and, you know, everything else will fall into place. Like Andy said, ultimately that's a personal decision. And so often when we're doing events with CKF, whether it be at X Games or another venue in years past, you don't want to really push people to say, hey, make a decision on the spot. That's a very personal and private decision. Here's the information. You go home and review it and make the best decision for you and your family. We're not telling you to say yes or no, but here are the facts, here's the information, here was my decision and here was my experience. And I think that's a great approach by you. I commend you on that. Thanks. Dr. Kula, we got a question from, oh, Debbie and Nick, we will uh, get you the uh, information from our friends at SODA as well as uh, our CKF uh, toolkit for teachers uh, and information. So we'll get that to you and we've got your email here. Dr. Kula, a great question uh, from Wills. He says, what is the most rewarding and also most difficult part of your job? Mm, that is a really good question. And, you know, first off, I'll put a plug for anyone um, still kind of figuring out their career and things like that, that I have really enjoyed working in healthcare and there are so many great jobs. I think it's so much fun being a doctor. It's sometimes, you know, it's, it's challenging. You have to work a bit. You don't get to sleep as much as you want to, but um, 
you know, and you have to do a lot of paperwork, but it's just a fun job. And I think healthcare is great because there's so much you can do for people. And whether that's you're a nurse, you're a respiratory therapist, you're a medical assistant, you're a social worker, it's just, it's a really a, a rewarding field. Um, and so I just would put that plug in. Now, as far as I think the most rewarding and challenging parts. And so I, you know, in some ways, I think they kind of go together. And so one of the most challenging um, parts of kind of my job now, um, treating young people who have kidney disease is, you know, sometimes you want the best for all your patients. You want everyone to respond to the medicine and go back to living their lives. But sometimes diseases are progressive. And even though they eat exactly what you tell them to, they don't eat what you, you don't tell not to eat. They take all their medicines. They really are great patients you know, their disease will continually progress. And sometimes that can be very difficult. And one of the most challenging things is, I think hope plays a really important role in healthcare. And it's helping people see that even when what they would feel is a hopeless situation, that it's still there. And often it's just a reframing. And really I've come to appreciate that no matter what, there's usually a way forward. And, um, and it's kind of really coming to appreciate that as a patient that can do a lot of benefit. And so I think for me, it's really challenging when I see someone who's sick and there's in, even though we have so much um, at our kind of fingertips, there's nothing we can do to slow it down. It's, it's seeing when they really kind of take ownership and when they realize that, hey, something's going bad in my life, but there's things I still want to do. And, you know, maybe I don't have the same energy, but I still want to go and see my friends or, you know, maybe I can't eat all the foods I want, but there are some foods I still like. And you really see that people still find that they can have a meaningful life. And often, sometimes we have this wonderful tool like an organ transplantation where these people who have really kind of made the world glass half full, they then they get a transplant and it really becomes really full. And so it's just, um, you know, I think it's a challenging aspect of health care, but I think it also um, is so rewarding when you can see people really kind of live a meaningful, happy life, you know, in spite of everything else that's going on. Well said, I love it. Lauren, do you have uh, any other questions you want to pose before I... Uh give our panel speakers one more chance to share any uh, last thoughts? I don't. Um, I think it's a good time to kind of wrap up. And if anybody has any other questions, we can follow up directly with them. Perfect. Andy, I want to uh, give you one more chance uh, to share anything that uh, I missed or that you didn't have a chance to elaborate on. Love to hear some final comments from you. Um, I would just say, you know, thank you, because uh, this is what I'm passionate about. Um, this is another opportunity to help save a life. And uh, you don't get to say that every day in your job, but this truly is, you know, somebody leaves here and can go sign up or somebody leaves here and goes and educate somebody else and they sign up and that's truly life saving. Um, and so, you know, I, I messaged Robin outside of here because the, that it comes back to the, the true hero, her mom and um, the other donors out there. And, and then you and Dr. Kula are here today because of this uh, wonderful mission and, um, uh, you know, this second chance of life. So um, I thank you guys uh, anytime I can educate. And uh, I did see one other question in the chat box. I am happy to share um, the slides I use and uh, give anybody ideas uh, of how to be engaging, you know, like what can I bring to my presentation to talk about a tough topic? Because that's truly what it, you know, can sometimes feel like. So thank you. Thank you, Andy. Love what you're doing. Keep up the good work. And uh, we are gonna put you, I, I don't know if I uh, shared this caveat, but all three of you now are, uh, as being a part of this conversation, required to come to Aspen do the uh, Summit for Life with me, 3267 vertical feet at night up Aspen Mountain with 400 of your best friends, followed by a day of snowboarding. So uh, little did you know that uh, Lauren and Cece signed you up for that too when you agreed to be a part of this panel. Get the, get the bunny hill ready. <laughs> no bunny hills, we're putting you on Aspen Mountain. No. <laughs>
Robin, how about you? Do you want to, uh, any, any last thoughts you'd like to share? Um, yeah, actually one big one that I did forget to mention, um, while I was explaining everything, you know, and the, um, paramedics were getting there and how long it took for them to realize she was a donor, um, about 24 hours, they will do everything they can to save your life. Um, so please don't let that deter you from, you know, becoming an organ donor. Um, they, they really do everything and it's not like they're looking for your wallet to check and see if that heart's on your license. Um, you know, they'll do everything. So, um, very important. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks for being a part of it. Good luck with school and uh, thanks for all you're doing with our friends at SOTA with the uh, Hudson Valley Community College chapter. Thanks. You bet. Thank you. Dr. Kula, you want to share uh, anything else that we missed? Um, no, just, you know, um, thanks so much for having me. Um, having me, it's, uh, you know, organ, uh, organ donation has really um, just given me such a uh, it's giving me a second chance in life and giving me an opportunity to really do so much fun, cool stuff. And, um, and yeah, and if anyone ever has questions or anything like that, I'm sure there's some way uh, they could be sent along, but yeah, this is, this has been a lot of fun and it's uh, I'm, I'm glad I had a chance to hang out with you guys. It's a pretty, a pretty special community, the transplant community. And uh, Oh yeah. Like you, I've developed some great friendships and uh, it's taken me all over the country and, and met, uh, donor heroes and, and fellow recipients and folks like yourself in the medical community. And it's a really special group of people. So I'm very grateful for our conversation tonight and for the opportunity in the last 20 years to meet so many uh, wonderful people just like yourselves. I want to say thanks uh, to our friends at Hearts for Russ for sponsoring tonight. I want to say thanks to uh, Sarah and her whole team at uh, SOTA um, for partnering with us on this event tonight. Again, thanks to our panelists. And I wanna say special thanks to uh, Lauren Pierce, our executive director and to CC Cunningham, our program director that uh, do such an awesome job. Uh, I just try to get out of their way because they're so awesome. They're the real brains behind this whole operation. And uh, I wanna say thanks to uh, Lauren and CC for organizing this tonight and, and doing such a nice job uh, leading our organization. Uh, on that note, Lauren, I'll uh, pass it back to you to uh, wrap things up. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Thanks um, for everyone that joined us today. And there were a lot of questions that may not have been answered. And Dr. Kula has um, offered to, to contact you guys some directly. So we'll take some of those questions and hopefully we'll put you in touch uh, with him. And also, um, the goal of this webinar was to educate you with the facts of organ donation so that you can make an educated decision when you're asked if you want to become an organ donor. You can register that decision on chrisklugfoundation.org. Or if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. If you're interested in advocating for organ donation, please check out sodanational.org for steps on how to develop a soda chapter at your school. April's Donate Life Month. So we are always looking to partner with any students, sports teams, your school. We'd love to host an event, class, webinar, um, anything we can do to really bump up the education in April. So please do not hesitate to contact us. We hope you have a great evening. Stay safe, stay healthy, and still remember to wash your hands. <laughs>